Today is December 12th. It's the 347th day of the year, and this is the On This Day podcast. On this day in 1901, Guillermo Marconi receives the first transatlantic radio signal at the receiving station on Signal Hill outside St. John's, Newfoundland. Or he hears some atmospheric crackling noise that he mistakes for three clicks, Morse code for the letter S. Marconi is born into Italian nobility in Bologna in 1874. He's interested in electricity and science at an early age, particularly the burgeoning area of wireless telegraphy. Lots of engineers and inventors are working in the relatively new field of wireless signaling. Thomas Edison, Nikola Tesla, Reginald Fessenden, and Lee DeForest, to name just a few. In 1888, Heinrich Hertz demonstrates how one can create and detect radio waves, which come to be called Hertzian waves, as in 10 kilohertz or 40 hertz. That's what you want to add to get that bass drum kicking. Marconi begins conducting experiments of his own as a young man in Italy. He builds his own components and tests out different methods of wirelessly sending and receiving telegraphic messages. The longest distance he's able to transmit a signal is half a mile. But through experimentation, he discovers he can increase the distance of his transmissions by raising his antenna and grounding his equipment. He tries to get state funding to continue his work, but the Italian Ministry of Post and Telegraphs isn't much interested in his wireless approach. In fact, they think he's crazy. So he makes his way to England, where there's more interest in the new technology of the wireless. His work is well received by the British, who encourage him after every demonstration. When he transmits and receives a wireless signal a distance of nearly four miles across Salisbury Plain in southern England, and across the open sea of the Bristol Channel in southwest England. Both demonstrations given in 1897. Marconi is an inventor, but he's also a businessman, and he's always been interested in exploiting the commercial prospects of wireless. By the turn of the century, Marconi sets his sights on conquering a much larger body of water, wirelessly bridging the Great Divide of the Atlantic Ocean in order to develop a profitable long-distance wireless telegraph service. His plan calls for the construction of two superstations, giant aerial systems of antennas on either side of the ocean. On the eastern side of the Atlantic, he builds an array on land overlooking Poldu Cove in southwestern Cornwall, England, and he establishes the western terminal on the sand dunes of South Wellfleet on the north end of Cape Cod, Massachusetts. Construction on both terminals begins in 1900 and is completed in early 1901. However, before Marconi can successfully send a transmission across the ocean, Both of his superstation's aerials will be destroyed in storms. Poldhu in Cornwall in September of 1901, and South Wellfleet two months later in November. He rebuilds the Poldhu station, but relocates the eastern terminal to Signal Hill near St. John's, Newfoundland. And instead of building an array of masts and wires and massive fan and conical shapes, Marconi decides to fly his antenna on kites and balloons. He sets up shop in an abandoned fever and diphtheria hospital on Signal Hill, and cables pulled who to start transmitting the letter S in Morse code, continuously for four hours every day. On this day in 1901, Marconi and his assistant George Kemp launched two kites, each with a 500-foot wire attached to it. The wind carries the kites up into the sky, but they bob and weave in the air making it difficult for Marconi to dial in the frequencies. Marconi is reportedly using a frequency on the MF band for this experiment, 850 kilohertz to be specific, and he's doing so in the middle of the day, which is the worst time to try to send and receive such a frequency. Radio waves travel better at night, and that particular frequency in the MF band during the day covering the 2200 miles between Signal Hill and Poldu just doesn't seem possible which is why some are skeptical then in 1901 and now of Marconi's claim of a successful transmission on this day. 
However, according to Marconi's laboratory notebook, he received signals at 12.30, 1.10, and 2.20 p.m. local time. The first transmission of transatlantic radio signals on this day in 1901. Many decades later, the IEEE, the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, installs a plaque on Signal Hill commemorating the achievements of Guillermo Marconi and George Kemp on this day, noting, quote, Their experiments showed that radio signals extended far beyond the horizon, giving radio a new global dimension for communication in the 20th century. The future of wireless, as far as Marconi is concerned, is all about the telegraph. For all of his vision and foresight, he doesn't anticipate the development of radio and broadcasting. He doesn't foresee the advent of wireless telephony, and certainly not the mobile phone. Nonetheless, he will receive fame and fortune when the Marconi Wireless plays a critical role in the rescue of survivors of and the transmission of the news of the sinking of the Titanic in 1912. And even before his death in 1937 at the age of 63, Guillermo Marconi will be heralded as the inventor of radio. There are 19 days left in the year. On This Day is produced by me, Dave Schultz. Thank you very much for listening. If you're new to the show, check us out on Twitter at On This Day Pod. Again, that's at On This Day P-O-D. Or Facebook forward slash On This Day Podcast. And many, many thanks to all of you who are not new listeners and have been listening for a while. You know I really do appreciate it, and I really do. So if you're still listening, I really do. Okay, talk to you tomorrow. <laughs>